Our reading is from Luke 2, uh, from verses 21 to 40. That's Luke 2, from 21 to 40. And you'll find it on page 723 in the, in the Bibles in the pews. Seven twenty-three. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of the purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the Lord required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phenuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. Juliet, thank you very much indeed. Morning, everybody. Um, so grateful to Alita for attending that course and how important that work is, isn't it, in these days uh, with children battling uh, for all sorts of different reasons. And we as a church very much want to be part of helping children in that situation. So do please be praying for Alita and the team as they work out how best to draw children from those contexts uh, to our church to find healing and hope. Um, and then a second message. Um, some of you will remember that a few years ago we had um, Bishop Godfrey from Tanzania with us in the church family, and I've had occasion to be in touch with him this week. He's the bishop of a very large diocese up in Tanzania, and when Raymond and I were attending the City to City course in Joburg a couple of weeks ago, we came across a young man who wants to plant a church up there and needed some help, so I've been able to put him in touch with Bishop Godfrey, who sends you all uh, his warmest, warmest greetings. So that's a joy, isn't it? These lovely connections across Africa. Now, if you're not used to uh, looking at the Bible this way, I think it will be helpful to you to keep uh, Luke 2 open in front of you as we look at it a little bit more closely together but first we need to ask for the Lord's help. So let's pray. 
Gracious God, we we thank you so much that through the Lord Jesus, you have made it possible for us to come boldly to you as our Heavenly Father. And we ask that as we look at this portion of your word, that you would speak to us, that you would rebuke us as we need it, challenge us as we need it, and teach us as we need it. Please make this a very special time for everyone here this morning, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I'm sure I don't need to tell you that we are living in an age that dislikes waiting. Uh, We don't like waiting in traffic. We don't like waiting in the queue at pick and pay. And we don't like waiting in the waiting room for the the doctor or for the dentist. The, The fast food industry only exists because... When we're hungry, we simply won't wait. But for Christians, this kind of cultural bias against waiting is actually very unhelpful because waiting is actually a precious spiritual discipline. Now, we're not here talking about the kind of trivial waiting that's a part of everyday life. I'm not saying that an hour and a half on the N3 in traffic is a marvellous thing for us to be doing. I'm not saying that. But the waiting that is a crucial part of our spiritual growth uh, is living through those times when we're waiting for God to do something and we're acutely conscious of our complete inability to hurry him up. And in those times, the way that we wait will always reveal where we've placed our hope. So, for example, if your hope is in your marvellous intellect uh, or your abilities, then you're always going to find it really difficult to deal with circumstances that make absolutely no sense to you, and you just have to wait on God to reveal his purpose. Well, our passage this morning introduces us to two people who were experts at the right kind of waiting. Uh, They have two things in common. The first is that both of them are old. Uh, Tradition says that Simeon was 113 years old, and it's very clear from the story that he's expecting to die soon. Anna is at least in her 80s and very possibly older than that. And you can't help noticing from the passage that in spite of their age, They've lost none of their spiritual zeal. Uh, We're told that Simeon was still righteous and devout. That's pretty good going at 113, isn't it? Anna never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Now that's because, secondly, they're both waiting for the same thing. They both share the same hope. So just look at verse 25. Uh, In verse 25, we're told that Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Well, that's a pretty strange phrase. What on earth does it mean? Well, we're told in the very next verse, verse 26. Verse 26 says, It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So Simeon was waiting for Jesus. That's where he had placed his hope. Then towards the end of the passage in verse 38, can we all see verse 38 in our Bible? Anna sees Jesus. And straight away she knows that her long wait has been rewarded. Because notice at the end of verse 38, it says, she spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. So Anna knows precisely who Jesus is, and immediately she tells her friends. 
Now, clearly, Luke recorded this incident because Simeon and Anna are examples for you and me. From them, we can learn what godly waiting looks like. And the message of this passage is that the way that we do that is by putting our hope in the same place that they did. So so we don't develop the spiritual discipline of godly waiting by trying a lot harder to be patient. It's not that. No, we learn godly patience by looking at the same person that they were waiting for, the Lord Jesus, and understanding what it is about him that made Simeon and Anna wait faithfully for so long. So what was it about Jesus that motivated them to do that? Well, in this passage, we learn three things about Jesus and his work on earth that are just as important for us this morning as they were back then. And because they're things that we sometimes tend to forget, we need to think about them very carefully indeed. First, Simeon and Anna knew that Jesus was an obedient saviour, an obedient saviour. We're looking here at verses 21 to 24. Now, I hope you know that whenever the Bible repeats a word or a phrase, we know straight away that it's trying to make a point. Well, here, on no less than six occasions, Luke says something about the relationship between the Lord Jesus and the Old Testament law. Now, you may think, well, the Old Testament law is not very interesting to me this morning, but please stay tuned because I can assure you that it is. In verse 21, that relationship is implied in what Luke says about Jesus being circumcised on the eighth day. Now, that's important because that's the requirement that God gave to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 17. Now, I'm not going to drag you through all the other examples, but I want you to notice that on five other occasions that Mary and Joseph did certain things in involving Jesus in obedience to the law. And you might just want to jot down the references. You can look them up later. But you'll find them in verse 22, verse 23... Verse 24, verse 27, and verse 39. Now, what's the point? Well, you see, Luke is drawing our attention to the fact that Jesus submitted himself to the law of God and he obeyed it perfectly, even from his infancy. Now, if we're thinking people, and I know you all are, that should cause us to stop and think. Because last week, uh, do you remember, we visited the, the manger in Bethlehem, and we heard the angel's announcement that this human baby, born in utter squalor, is nothing less than God himself. Do you remember the angel said that he is Savior, Christ, Lord. Now, If Jesus is God, it means that he actually gave the law. But now we find that having entered our world as a human being, he's voluntarily submitted himself to its authority. Now, why did he do that? Very interesting. Keep a finger in Luke 2. Turn with me, please, to Galatians chapter 4 on page 824. Galatians chapter 4, verse 824. Galatians 4, verse 4. Paul writes, But when the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under law. Now, why did he do that? Verse 5, to redeem those under law, that's us, 
that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Now let's kind of decode that. What Paul's saying here is that in the law, the Old Testament law, God laid down the conditions on which we can have a relationship with him. The problem is that left to ourselves, you and I can never satisfy those conditions. And so, by nature, we all stand under his his righteous judgment. It's a hopeless situation. And that's why, in verse 7 of Galatians 4, Paul describes our natural situation, our natural condition, if we're not Christians, as slavery. That means if you are not a Christian this morning, it might surprise you to know that God sees you as a slave. And for that reason, God sent Jesus to do two things for us. At first, Jesus rescues us from God's judgment against our disobedience by his death on the cross. Well, every Christian knows that. But what many Christians either don't know or very often forget is that Jesus also obeyed the law perfectly on our behalf. Now, why is that important? It's important Because when we become Christians, God sees his obedience, the perfect obedience of Jesus, as our obedience. And that means, you see, that we're not only forgiven sinners, but it also means that we're welcomed into God's family as his sons and daughters. We're no longer slaves to the law because Jesus became a slave to the law, and he obeyed it perfectly on our behalf. Now, there's a massively important application here, which is quite easy to miss. Let me give you an illustration that I hope will make it a bit clearer. Uh, There's a small country on the north coast of South America called Suriname. In the 1800s, there were some missionaries working there who wanted to take the gospel to a little island just off the coast. But the island was covered with plantations that were being worked by slaves. And the plantation owners didn't actually want missionaries coming onto the island and talking to their slaves. They thought it would be bad for business. So they had a rule that the only people who could talk to slaves were other slaves. So what happened was some of these missionaries actually became slaves themselves in order to take the gospel to the slaves on this island in the plantations. Uh, In obedience to their calling to take the gospel, that was a price that they were willing to pay. And of course, seeing those missionaries making such a tremendous sacrifice, the slaves on the plantations were actually willing to listen to them. And many of them did come to faith in Christ, praise God. Now, folks, that's the idea in Luke chapter 2. Come back there now. Luke is telling us that Jesus placed himself under the law of God as a slave. He placed himself under the law that you and I have broken again and again and again, And he obeyed it perfectly and fully that we might be forgiven and reconciled to God. But look at what it cost him. You know, he set aside his glory in heaven to become a slave like us. And he was obedient even to the most shameful death you can possibly think of. And he did it simply so that you and I could become members of God's family. Now, folks, that's the first reason why Simeon and Anna 
were willing to wait for so long. They had placed their hope in a Messiah who through his perfect obedience would bring men and women back into God's family. That was their hope. And I hope it's your hope as well. Secondly, come back to Luke 2. We need to think about what Simeon says about Jesus being not just an obedient saviour, but also a universal saviour in verses 25 through to 32. If you have a prayer book at home, you will know that like Mary's song, uh, like Zachariah's song that we've already looked at, Simeon's song in these verses, verses 29 to 32, has been in the prayer book for hundreds of years. Uh, It's still used in evening prayer in many churches around the world today. And the reason that Christians have treasured it is because it takes us right to the very heart of the Christian message. How does it do it? Well, I want you to use your sanctified imaginations for a moment. Try and imagine the setting in Luke 2. Uh, After many years of waiting, Simeon is prompted by the Holy Spirit to go into the temple courts. And when he gets there, he sees a young couple with a baby. Mary was about 13 years old at the time, and Joseph was probably in his 20s. And Simeon just walks up to them, And he says, can I hold the baby? Now remember that Simeon has received a promise from Almighty God that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ. And now with the baby Jesus in his arms, Simeon praises God for two things. First, He praises God for allowing him, now notice the language, allowing him to see salvation. Verse 30. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Now what on earth is he talking about? How do you see salvation? Well, the only thing that Simeon's eyes have seen is the baby. And as you and I think about that, gradually we realize, don't we, that Simeon is holding salvation in his arms. The point is so obvious you can easily miss it. But what we're meant to understand is that salvation is Jesus and nothing else. Salvation is not Jesus plus church. Salvation is not Jesus plus my good behavior or my good deeds. Salvation is not Jesus plus my brilliant Bible knowledge. It's not. Who is this salvation for? Well, this is the second point. Simeon praises God because this salvation is for everybody. It's universal. Look at verse 30 again. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, that's the nations, that's us, and for glory to your people, Israel. Now, this is extremely controversial today. I mean, it's miles away, isn't it, from the popular view that all religions are basically the same, uh, that all roads lead to heaven in the end. No, it's making the claim that Jesus is the saviour of the world and there isn't another one. And so, you see, whether it's in our gatherings here together on a Sunday... Uh, or in our home groups, or whether it's just reading the Bible with a friend, we want to offer this salvation to everyone. 
Okay, let's be clear. What does this salvation actually mean in practice? Salvation sounds like a religious word. People are suspicious of religious words. What are we talking about? In the New Testament, salvation means rescue. It means rescue from something, and it means rescue for something completely different. Specifically, salvation is rescue from spiritual trouble and danger, and it's rescue for a life that's really worth living. And I want to pause on this for just a second and clarify that in the New Testament, friends, salvation is never just a fact of history. You know, you do hear Christians from time to time talking about the night I was saved. And in a sense, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. As long as when we hear it, we recognize that it's incomplete. Because in the New Testament, salvation always has three tenses. Uh, I know some of you know this, but some of you don't. Let me repeat it. It means in the past... We have been saved from sin and guilt. All our sins, all our guilt, have been fully dealt with at the cross. Amen? Amen. Amen. In the present, we are being saved from the power of sin in our lives. Yes, as, as Christians, we still sin. Yes, we do. Ask Gillian. I still sin. But sin no longer controls me in the way that it did before. Because the Holy Spirit is living within me and within you, helping us to live a new life. And then in the future, we will be saved from the judgment of God, because that's coming, and saved for eternal life with Jesus when we die. And that, of course, is the significance, the application of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and his promise to come back and take us to be with him at the end of our pilgrimage on earth. Now that's why, friends, Simeon begins the song in the way that he does in verse 29. Have a look at it. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. Dismiss from what? Dismiss from life. He's 113. And he's showing us here, you see, that salvation gives a person the ability to face death without fear. Uh, this is one of the obvious and most crucial differences between the Christian and the pagan. What we believe about death has got radical implications for the way that we live our lives here and now. So on the one hand... Uh, listen to what one very prominent atheist has to say about this. Uh, his name is Ronald Dworkin, not to be confused with Richard Dawkins. Ronald Dworkin, who was a scholar in constitutional law and a professor in philosophy at three universities, at London, New York, and Oxford. Now, what does somebody as super brilliant as that have to say about death. Can he help us this morning? Listen to what he says. This is in one of his books. He says, death's central horror is oblivion. The terrifying, absolute dying of the light. Death has dominion because it's not only the start of nothing, but the end of everything. So, when this brilliant professor who lectures at three of the biggest universities in the world thinks about death, he is absolutely terrified. Compare that with the American missionary Adoniram Judson. Uh, 200 years ago, uh, Judson set off for Burma, which is modern-day Myanmar, and he went to preach the gospel. Uh, before he set sail, he proposed to his first wife, Anne, in these remarkable words. He said to her, 
Give me your hand to go with me to the jungles of Asia and there die with me in the cause of Christ. Now that's not obviously a formula for winning young ladies today, is it? Trimor, when you're proposing to the young lady of your dreams, please don't use that language, it'll get you nowhere. But clearly, Judson believed it. Uh, During his 37 years in Burma, he was widowed twice. He lost no fewer than six of his children. He was imprisoned for two years and he was beaten by the authorities regularly. But when he died in 1850, he left behind 7,000 Christians in Burma. There hadn't been any when he arrived and 63 churches. And today there are about 3 uh, 3 million Christians in Myanmar. And all because just one man was able to face death without fear. Because like Simeon, Judson understood that for the Christian death isn't the end, is it? And he was willing to live sacrificially so that other people would come to salvation. So Simeon and Anna were waiting for a saviour who was perfectly obedient to God's law, and his salvation would be for all people everywhere. Everyone needs to hear the gospel. He sounds so wonderfully attractive. But there was a third quality that Simeon saw that was rather more sobering. Simeon says this child will be an offensive saviour. Verses 33 to 40. Obedient, yes. Universal, yes. But also offensive. Verses 33 to 40. I mean, up to this point, everything Simeon's had to say has sounded marvellously positive. Uh, You can imagine, can't you, Mary and Joseph listening to that and beaming from ear to ear. But suddenly, in verse 34, the tone changes. Simeon says to Mary... Verse 34, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now, what I want you to remember when you read those words is that this meeting in the temple had been arranged by Almighty God uh, through the Holy Spirit. Do you remember it was the Spirit, wasn't it, who promised Simeon that he would see Jesus. It was the Spirit who prompted Simeon to enter the temple courts on the right day at exactly the right time. So I take it that what Simeon says here is actually God's warning to Mary to prepare her for what's coming. Because yes, Jesus is going to do marvellous things that's going to alter the complete course of human history. But how will he do it? Well, Simeon says Jesus will. He will offend. He will divide. And he will expose. So that phrase, falling and rising, is talking about Christian conversion. It's saying that salvation begins with my own good opinion of myself as being a marvellous person being thoroughly dismantled by the gospel as I come face to face with my sin. Because the gospel shows me that my natural instinct is always to go my way rather than God's way. And I have to face the fact that I'm guilty in the sight of God. And if you're like me, that's quite a fall. It's offensive, actually. But can I say to you this morning that if you've never reached that point, you're not yet a Christian. But then having hit that low point, by the grace of God, there is a rising that follows. Because in the moment that I do see myself from God's point of view, I start to realize that I can be forgiven because of the death of Jesus on the cross. So what do I do? Well, I humble myself 
and I ask God for his forgiveness. And as I look to Christ's resurrection from death, so I rise and I find that I have a new hope in my heart which I hadn't had before. It's the hope of new life now and of being with Jesus forever in heaven. So Simeon also says, please notice, that Jesus will be a sign to be spoken against. Now, if you read your Bible, you know that was perfectly true in his own lifetime. His own people turned against him. He turned out not to be the saviour they wanted, didn't he? So they nailed him to a cross. But you see, it's still true today. Jesus, listen carefully, Jesus is a divider. He is not a unifier. And uh, by the way that you respond to him, what he's going to do is he's going to flush you out into the open. You won't be able to hide. So later on in chapter 12 of Luke's Gospel, Jesus warns his disciples in these words. He says, do you think I came to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, and two against three. Now, I know that some of you here this morning know exactly what that's like. You decided to follow Jesus, and in doing that, you lost the support of other members of your family. But I want to remind you that it's always been like that. You haven't been singled out for special attention. There is trouble everywhere Jesus goes. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was one of the most effective pastors of the 20th century. And at one point he was pastoring a church in South Wales. And while he was there, uh, God blessed his ministry with the most astonishing revival. And one particularly rough character was converted to Christ out of alcoholism. And he began to attend the Monday night prayer meeting. But for months, whenever he got home after that meeting, his wife would scream at him. She would say, I would rather you came home drunk than from a prayer meeting. Now that's the kind of division that Jesus brings. It's not rational. Uh, You can't negotiate your way out of it. It's a spiritual division. Because whenever the Jesus of the New Testament is faithfully preached, he divides communities and he divides families and sometimes he even divides churches. Well, that's pretty sobering. So, is it realistic to expect people to put their trust today in such an offensive saviour? I mean, is that a realistic expectation? Are your non-Christian friends and family going to want to hear about him? Well, only if we tell them that like Simeon and Anna, we're also waiting for him because he's coming back. We don't know when. All that we do know is that when he comes, everybody on this earth, without exception, will face him either as saviour or as judge. And when we say that to our friends and family, what will happen is they will look at us, they will look at our lives to see whether by the way that we live, we really believe that's true. They'll be looking to see whether we are waiting well. So friends, can I say to us this morning that in the crises and the trials that all of us have to face, is our hope in Jesus or not? Have we placed our hope perhaps in something else? Do we really see Jesus as the salvation that God has provided for everybody? If so... Are we going the extra mile to make sure other people hear about him? 
I mean, does he really dominate and shape the way that we think? Or is he just someone we think about occasionally, someone to be kind of squeezed into our lives whenever, whenever it's convenient? Because, you see, the way that you and I answer those questions might be all the difference between our friends and loved ones coming to salvation or rejecting the message as foolish and offensive. Well, let's pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we humbly confess we are not good at waiting. When you delay in answering our prayers, we are often impatient. We so quickly look elsewhere to satisfy our needs. Father, forgive us. Thank you that through Jesus, you've given us a place in your eternal family. We are your dearly loved sons and daughters, and you always know what's best for us. So help us to learn from Simeon and Anna by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus and placing our trust in him in all circumstances. And we pray that as you give us grace to do that, that others will see and ask us to give the reason for the hope that we have. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.